Well, I started on this journey a long, long time ago. Lost in sin and darkness, carrying a heavy load. That's when Jesus found me and he saved my soul. He said, son, it's going to get better a little farther down the road. A little farther down the road, we'll see Jesus. A little farther down the road, just trust his word. A little farther down the road, we'll see loved ones. A little farther down the road, we'll see the Lord. Old Saul was on the road to Damascus town. Christian. Brother Mark, I would like every single person in the room to have a fork. If you didn't get one, please, I, you, you got to have a fork. You say, what are you doing? Just get a fork. Get a fork. Logan did a great job a minute ago, by the way. Where did Logan go? Thank you, buddy. He was distributing, wasn't he? Very good. I want to, as Brother Mark is distributing the forks, I'm going to lay it up here. Because I want you to get a hold of something today. Got a whole slew of people over here that don't have forks, and they can't eat without the forks. So we got to get forks to these people. And I, I, I'm going to wait just a few minutes as you're, if you've got a fork, turn over to 1 Corinthians, if you don't mind. We all need forks, don't we? That's right. Very good. Preacher's done lost his mind bringing out forks. I have learned a long time ago that your mind associates. That's one of the ways we learn. They say 85% of what you know is went through your eye gate and went through your ear gate and through your openings that God has set up for you to understand. And this mere illustration this morning is today we're going to take off a big chunk of spiritual meat. And you need a fork to stick in it, to hold it. There's been many messages over the years that someone has used something like this to cause me to grab it, to understand it, and I've never forgotten it. Rex and I earlier were talking in the office about certain messages that have come across our paths and lives paths that have brought things to our mind that we've never forgotten. Just a few nights, a few weeks ago, I preached on rain. I preached on... Now, the book of Acts talks about rain as a testimony to the existence of God. And I thought in the last some few days, that ought to shut up by any atheist that we have out there. But God has so many illustrations. And several years ago, I preached in a revival down in Middle Tennessee, and I used a, a thistle. And I called a pastor, and I said, Do you mind if I bring the thistle in the church? I, he said, what are you going to do with a thistle? I said, do you mind if I bring a thistle in a bucket? He said, no. So I went out in the field and I chopped the thistle and I put it in a five-gallon bucket and I walked in and I set it on the floor of the auditorium and sat there and I preached on the thistles of your life. Months later, a guy texted me and he said, I've never forgotten the message on the thistle. So this morning, I hope, by the help of this small little object lesson, you'll not forget this morning's message. So profound, I believe, from the Word of God that it will change your life if you'll let it. What I'm about to preach to you this morning is not my ideas, not my ingenuity. It's right out of the Word of God. And if we'll take what we see this morning, I think God will use it to transform your life. Notice what it says in 1 Corinthians 10 and verse number 1. Moreover, brethren, now that moreover just simply says, hey, I want you to get this. If out of all the things that's going on today, get this. If you get nothing else, that's what moreover he's saying. Above everything, get this. Brethren, I would not that you should be ignorant how that our fathers were under the cloud and all passed through the sea. Jump down with me to verse number 11. Now all these things, notice that expression, now all these things happened unto them for an examples. And they are written for our admonition, upon whom the ends of the world are come. Wherefore let him that thinketh he standeth take heed lest he fall. 
There hath no temptation taken you, but such is common to man. But God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that which you are able, but with the temptation also make a way to escape, that you may be able to bear it. Jump down with me to verse 33. The Bible says, Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking my own profit, but the profit of many, here it is, that they may be saved. I want to preach a message to you this morning. It's a strong chunk of meat. It's a strong message. And we're going to dissect it here in just a minute. But I want to give you the, the truths that I find in these words. He tells us again, he says, all these things happened unto you. I don't know where your life has been in the last some few years. I don't know the path you've taken. But I do know this. The things that have happened to you, God wants to use them. God wants to use the things that has happened to you that you might help someone down the road. I believe with all of my heart, you're, if you're a Christian this morning, if you trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, you are not left alone. What I simply mean by that is, God didn't save you just to save you. Not only He wants to save you and take you to heaven when you die, but He saved you so you might get someone else saved. You're, you're here today, you're breathing God's air as a Christian, I trust, and if you're not today, you need to trust Jesus as your Savior because you'll die and go to hell if you don't. But if you have trusted Jesus Christ as your Savior, and according to the Word of God, if we'll live in such a way as glorifying the Lord, that others might be saved. That is the essence of the life that you've been given by God to live. Our life has been given to you. The main goal of the Christian life is to bring glory and honor to God and to live in such a way that someone else might find the Lord. That is the essence of the life that God's given you. It's pretty simple. You know, psychologists and psychiatrists want to make life so hard and so difficult, but God really boils it down to two things. Glorify Him and reach for your fellow man. It's pretty simple. And He tells us with these things, notice He says again, He says, now all these things happen. Now I want to title this message this morning, all the things that happened. But I thought, well, that's the truth of that scripture. I thought that would be the, the profound truth of that verse of scripture, and it's not. That is part of it. But when I read the last phrase of that verse, 33, I found out that's the truth that I want to implement today. Is that we will live in such a way and let God use all the things that happened to us. us. Brother Porter preached a message years ago, uh, months ago, about the piece of the puzzle. And he said, our life is like a puzzle, and every piece of the puzzle is for a reason. Same thing here. God allows things to happen in your life, and he allows things to happen in my life, that we might use them, that he might use them to bring glory and honor to God. Go back just one page in 1 Corinthians 9, and we'll find in verse 19, just one page back, one chapter back, Paul is writing to the Corinthian people and he's trying to get them to see that they've got a life to live and they wanna, he wants them to glorify God and he wants them to get the gospel to others that you know and love and around your family and it's in your neighbors and your co-workers and all that's around you. God, I, I call them divine appointments. I don't believe God ever brings, brings someone into my path of life on accident. I believe there's a reason for it. I believe God does something deliberately. I believe there's times that I deviate from a road or go down a different road or go down a different place or go to here or go there and there'll be a divine appointment. I believe God does those things. I don't know how many times God has brought opportunity to me and it's not for that particular opportunity. It's for a greater appointment. And most everything that God deals with about people deals with the salvation that they need. Everything, from your job, from your neighbor, from your co-worker, from walking into the store, everything has to do with the gospel. Amen. Everything. He says, verse 19, he says, For though I be free from all men, yet I have made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Paul said, I'm free. I don't have to do this. God set me free. He's paid for my sins on the cross. I've trusted Him as my Savior. I, know no, I owe no man in the sense of. But here's what he said. 
I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. Unto the Jews I became a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. Unto them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. Verse 20, to the weak became I weak, that I might gain the weak. I made all things to all men, here it is, that I might by all means save some. No, we understand we're not doing the saving. We understand I always get tickled when, when little kids talk that he saved me. Well, we understand Jesus does the saving. But the understanding is that somebody led them to Christ. Somebody talked to them about the gospel. Somebody gave them the understanding they need for the gospel. Now, the Holy Spirit is a great teacher, but God uses men and women to get the gospel to people. You say, how would this change my life? Because I'm telling you, once you learn what God says about living for God and glorifying Him and getting the gospel, it'll change your entire world. Not only them, but it'll, you, and it'll change them. Notice what he says. All things happen. Verse, excuse me, verse 24. Let me go a little further. When he says, I become all things to all men that I might save some. For this I do for the gospel's sake, that I might be partaker thereof with you. Nothing more is than thrilling to the soul of a Christian is to know they've got someone else to Christ. I said that in the last some recent days. I said, nothing brings new life to a church like new birth. There's nothing that ignites a church more than salvations and baptisms and church memberships and people moving toward God. Nothing stirs the church up more. That is revival. And truly, we wouldn't have to have revival meetings and we wouldn't have to have certain set-aside sessions of revival if that went on regular. Because it would always be a revival. We'd always be in a state of excitement, a state of uh, enthusiasm for God. Man getting saved, a lady getting saved, child getting baptized, uh, a person joining the church, on and on it goes. That brings life and new blood to the church. And Paul says, I do all this for the gospel's sake that I might be a partaker thereof. He says, know ye not that which you run, run in a race, run all, but one receiveth the prize. So run that you may obtain. Verse 27, here's where the fork comes in. Verse 27 starts the strong meat for the Christian. Because we'd all agree, I would believe, we'd all agree that we need to get the gospel to those that are lost. I think we'd all raise our hands and say, I got a lost uh, neighbor, I got a lost co-worker, I got a lost family member, they need the Lord. I think we'd all say that. But here it comes. Here's where the rubber meets the road. But I keep my body and bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means, when I have preached to others... I myself should be a castaway. So then you read the verse, moreover. Because there's lost ones out there, because those family members need Christ, because those neighbors need the Lord, because those things, I'm going to bring my body into subjection that they might trust Christ as Savior. You say, what are you saying? I'm simply saying they're watching you. I'm saying everything you are as a Christian, everything that happens to you, everything's involved in your life is for one reason, for God to use that for them to get saved. Amen. See, we make so light of the Christian life. We make so light like when it's my life, these things happen to me, they're secluded to only me. And let me just speak, speak a little tough love here just for a second. Hold on, buckle your seatbelt. A lot of times... And I, I'm going I'm to try to use compassion here. But a lot of times when things happen to an individual, they think it's never happened to no one else. And I'm not making light of the circumstances because I've had tragedy in my family. And you've had tragedy in your family. But just because something happens to you does not mean that's the end of the world. God wants to use it. See, we let the devil take our circumstances. We let the devil take things that happen to us and say, well, I'm going to give up now. I'm going to give in. I'm not going to let this. I'm not going to let God glorify by this. I'm not going to let God use this. And the whole time God says, I want to use that because there's others that you come in contact with that has went through the same thing. 
How many times have you come across somebody, somebody that has uh, may speak a, speak a statement to you and you think, that's exactly what's happened to me. You know what God's doing? God wants to use that. God wants to take that circumstance. God wants to, to implement that not only in your life, He wants to use that in their life. How many times have we come across people that need somebody to come along and encourage them, somebody to come along and speak a word of them and say, look, not that you may not know exactly what they're going through, but I feel your pain. I went through that valley. I understand the circumstance of that. I understand that there's tragedy and heartache and difficulty. Well, here under these contexts of this verse of Scripture, it's divided up in three examples. If you'll read chapter 10, if you'll read down to verses 1 down through verses number 8, he deals with categories. And I'm going to try to bring out three examples, try to pull some practical advice from it, and we'll go home. But the first one example that I want to show you, go with me to verse number 6. Notice his expression. Now in the context of this, this is dealing with the nation of Israel. When they came out of Egypt, God gave them specific instructions what to do and what not to do. And basically, that's the reason I wanted you to bring the fork today because this is going to illustrate what I'm about to preach to you this morning is the meat of the Word of God. It's not just milk because we've got to die to self. We've got to put away the flesh. We've got to mortify what we like. Why? Because somebody soul lays in the balance. So you don't live under yourself and you don't die under yourself. That's what he teaches us back in these previous chapters. You don't live under yourself. You don't die under yourself. There's somebody watching. There's somebody listening. There's somebody taking note of what you're doing. Notice what he says, verse number 6. Now these things were our examples to the intent we should not lust after evil things as they also lusted. Now I'm about to give you an example of those that do not regard God. Would you write that down somewhere? Examples of those that do not regard God. Now we understand there's a lot of people in the world that don't know and love the same God we love and serve. We understand that. We understand that there's a lost and dying world. We understand that there's people out in this world that do not know God, that do not want to know God, that do not know one of the salvation that He's bestowed upon them. But God has given us the opportunity to shine for Him. To be a light, to be salt, as He said, to be bread to those that are hungry. But as the examples were in the Old Testament, first one is, don't lust after evil things. And you know as well as I do, if the flesh is left to itself, it will self-destruct. If the flesh is not censored, if the flesh is not convicted, if the flesh is not cut off, it's not mortified, if it's give its head, if you will, it will destroy you. Everybody that you know that's wrapped up in some type of sin, some type of addiction, some type of, of corruption, it, it is something that the flesh likes. And if it wasn't for the grace of God, we'd all be there. If it wasn't for this grace that I'm speaking to you, and so often we, we judge someone's motives, we judge someone's outward appearance, not ever considering, if it weren't for the grace of God, so go us. So go us. He's given us a stiff warning that if we're going to, those that don't regard God are those that lust after evil things. That word lust is a strong Bible word, really strong. And it just simply means an overwhelming desire for things that is not yours. God says, don't lust after evil things. Don't lust, don't run after evil things. Notice what he says. He says, as they have also lusted. Here's a second one. Neither be idolaters. There's four of them here. Don't lust after evil things. Don't be an idolater. What in the world is idolater? Notice what he says. He explains it. As were some of them, as it is written, the people sat down to eat and drink and rose up to play. We are living in a day of society where entertainment is a God. If you don't believe that, just turn on the TV. I saw a funny picture the other day. It had a blizzard condition with a football stadium completely jam-packed. 
But you find a church building, 71 degrees, and you can't hardly fill it up. Because entertainment is a God today. It's exactly what happened in the days of old. That's exactly what happened here. Jesus said here, he says, Don't lust after evil things. Those that don't regard God are lusting after evil things. They're idolaters. They're putting something over God. That's what an idolater is, is once someone puts something over God. Well, I can't do that because I can't go to church because I've got this. Well, that's an idolatry. That's what God says. Notice this one. This is another strong Bible word. Verse number 8. Neither let us commit fornication as unto them committed and fell in one day three and twenty thousand. You read Numbers 25, you'll find out that 23,000 people died because they was in, committed in fornication. What is, commit, what is fornication? It's physical relationships outside of marriage. You'll read the story in Numbers 25 and you'll find that the sons of, uh, of Israel there were having relationships with the children of Moab. And God says, don't yoke up with those unbelievers. Don't yoke up with the, the devil's crowd. Don't yoke up with the children of Moab. And that's exactly what they did. The children of Moab knew if they would bring those women in, women of the night, they would bring them in, they would commit a fornication with the children of Israel, and the Bible says they would bring a plague upon that nation, and 23,000 died that night. Let me tell you something, friend. That principle is still alive today. You, you can't yoke up with the world. You can't yoke up with the lost world. You can't yoke up with unbelievers and expect God to bless that. That is, Bible says, committing fornication. That is having an illegitimate relationship with something that's not yours. God says, don't do that. 23,000 of them died because of that. You say, it's a big deal. It's a big deal. Here's another example he tells us. We see lusting after evil things. We see idolatry. We see fornication. Notice this one, verse 9. They tempted Christ. Verse 9 says, Neither let us tempt Christ as some of them also tempted and were destroyed by serpents. You know what that word tempting means? They chided. They argued with God. They fussed with God through Moses. You'll read Numbers 25. And the Bible says they chided with Moses... Because Moses said, we're going here. They said, no, we're not. We're chiding against Moses. And ultimately, you'll read Numbers 25, you'll find that they were not chiding with Moses. They were chiding with God. And God says, you're tempting me. And when you did that, I'm going to destroy you with serpents. It was so bad in the children of Israel camp when they were all dying. The Bible says God told Moses to take a, a, a pole, a serpent, and put it on a pole and raise it up. And if they would see that serpent, they could be healed. You know that same emblem today is on our ambulances? If you look across an ambulance, you see an EMT worker, and he'll have a pole with a serpent on it. That come right out of the Bible. Because the Bible says if Moses, they destroyed, they were destroyed by that serpent. He said if you lift that serpent up on a pole, they would see it and be healed. That's the sign of healing today. Come right out of the Bible. So God says... What is all this about? Don't tempt Christ. Don't lust after evil things. Don't be an idolater. Notice this one. This was a tough one. I hope you got your seatbelt on. You got your seatbelt on? Say amen. amen. Very good. You're not going to leave mad. Verse 10. Neither murmur as some of them also murmured and were destroyed of the destroyer. You know God hates murmuring. What's murmuring? I'll tell you what murmuring is. When something is said right from the word of God and you go, I don't believe that. I don't believe that's true. I don't believe that's murmuring. And when God says something, not what the preacher says, I'm talking about what God says. When God says do this or don't do that, you go, I don't believe that. God said he'd destroy you. Something interesting about murmuring, it just simply means to complain under your breath. You're a parent. You've heard that, haven't you? You correct, discipline, or do some kind of measurement there, you know, and you... And, and, and you're talking face to face and they don't like your comments and they go, <laughs> whoa, 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 what, what, what? No, no, no. Turn and look at me. What? It's different, isn't it? That's the way God is. God says, you want to win your neighbor? You want to win your coworker? You want to be the light that you should be? Don't murmur. When your boss says, do this, <laughs> Honestly, it's in the book. 
When your boss says this or your coworker says that or your leader or your guide or whatever it is in your workforce and you backbite and you say things you shouldn't say under your breath, you know what you're doing? You're really bucking God. And you'll never win that individual with that attitude. God said here, he said, don't tempt Christ because when they tempted him, I destroyed him with serpents. When they murmured against me, I destroyed him with the destroyer. Exodus 16, 8 says, the Lord heard your murmurings. See, I used to think that God would only hear my prayers, but he hears my murmuring too. I told you, you needed to fork. I told you, this is strong meat. We're taking off a big chunk of meat. Here's what I'm hoping with this little small illustration. Every time we use a fork, that I hope God reminds us that I better be the Christian I ought to be because there's somebody watching. I got some good news, though. Those are the examples of those that don't regard God. Here's the examples that do regard God. Notice with me verse number 16. See how it breaks up? God broke it up for us in verses 1 down to verse 15. Verses 16 talks about those that do regard God. Notice what it says, The cup of blessing which we bless, it is not the communion of the blood of Christ. The bread which we break, is it not the communion of the body of Christ? Notice what he says here. What he's trying to get us to see is, if you're in Christ, if you're fellowshipping at His table, that's what the Lord's Supper is all about, is us communing with Him. That's what that is. That represents His death, His burial, and His resurrection. That represents identifying with Him. Just like a baptism. Identify. I'm identifying with Christ. When you take up the Lord's Supper, what you're saying is, I'm identifying with Him. I'm identifying with His death, His burial, and His resurrection. He says, do you commune with the blood? Do you commune with the body? For we are being one bread, one body. Verse 19, what say I then, that the idol is anything? Verse 21, you cannot drink of the cup of the Lord and the cup of the devils. Be ye not partakers of the Lord's table and of the devil's table. You know what he's talking about here? He's talking about hypocrisy. He's talking about somebody that is wanting to walk with God with integrity and with decency. There's nothing in this world that will change this world like walking with God. There's nothing in this world that will change this world. They said revival is when the church influences the world. Compromise is when the world influences the church. It's time we get back to influencing the world right and for good for God. And we got to die to self to do that. Notice what he says. You can't drink of the devil's table and the Lord's table. You can't have it both ways. You can't take of sin and righteousness on the same. You can't have a, a dancing foot on a bended knee. It's just not going to happen. He said, don't be partakers. Because here's what happens. When you read these verses, you'll find that you confuse those that are lost. You confuse those that are, don't know God. When they see a Christian doing whatever... They're always going to judge you wrongly. I don't care who you are. I don't care what you're doing. If, you're, if you say you're an outspoken Christian, if you say, I know the Lord is my Savior, and you do anything, you blow your nose with a yellow handkerchief, they're going to criticize you. Well, it should be white. Just, just, know, just, make, it, just make a note of it. You're not going to win in some areas. But I don't want my life to be identified wrongly and to be authentic. You know what he's saying here? He's saying die to self. Keep your heart right with God. Don't yoke up. Don't sacrifice to devils. Don't eat of the Lord's table and the devil's table. Be ye separate. Verse 22. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? You know what he says? You better take the fellowship with God serious. Take it serious. The display of our life in the world's eyes is it needs to be serious. Go back with me to verse 13. I want, I want to hit this just a few more minutes about what happens to us. In verse 13, There hath no temptation taken you, but which is such common to man. That's where I said a few minutes ago about tough love. Anything that's ever happened to you, it's happened to someone else. You ever come across a lady, and I'm not here 
say anything negative about ladies that have children. But you ever come across a, a lady that had a child that she thinks she is the only one, any lady that's ever had a child? You ever had that? Or a man that has had a family and he's the only one that's ever had a family? And you want to say, this has been going on for centuries. You know, people, people's raised children for years. You're not the only one. But they, but they betray that. They betray like they're the only ones that ever done this. And they betray like they never had any, nobody's ever had problems like I have problems. The truth is, God said, according to those verses, He says there's no temptation that's not common to man. Somebody has dealt with what you're dealing with. But I love this. But God is faithful. Here it is who will not suffer you to be tempted above that you are able. But with the temptation, also make a way to escape. Why? That you may be able to bear it. God by His Spirit, if you'll commune with Him at His table, you'll commune with Him in His life and His death and His fellowship, if you'll commune with Him, He'll give you a way to get out of it. Multiple times, multiple times, God brings scenarios to your life, sees you through it, that there'll be somebody on the other side that needs the strength and help that you received going through it. What is all that about? That they might get saved. Notice what he says again. I love this phrase. He said, verse 12, Wherefore, let him that thinketh he stand, take heed lest he fall. One man said, It's not what happens to you. It's what you think happens to you. You know where the devil's battleground is? It's right here. The devil's battleground starts in your mind. Because if he can get in your mind... He can get in your heart. If he can get in your heart, he'll get your hands. You know what you are? You'll be rendered useless. Starts in the head, goes to the heart, works through the hands. One man, preacher friend, told me one time, he said, if God will ever get your mind, he'll get your hands and your heart. I see it all the time. Starts in the head, goes to the heart, and for long, they're doing nothing for God with their hands. He says, whatever you're thinking. He also tells us in these verses, casting down imaginations. There may be times that you just have to get along with God and say, God, I'm casting this down. I'm casting this thought to the ground. Casting down imaginations and every high thing that exalted itself against Christ. So we have those examples of those that don't regard God. We have those examples of those that do regard God. And I like verse 23. We have the examples of those that regard others. Because the truth is, you'll never regard others unless you regard God. See, I won't be the witness that I should be. I won't be the example that I should be in front of the lost and dying world if I'm not right with God. And there's a continual battle between me and the Lord. It's a continual battle between my flesh and the Spirit. It's a continual battle between He and I. And I'm always trying to win. And God says, submit to my will. Why? Verse 23. All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. You know what I get out of that verse? There are just some things you're not going to be able to do because you're going to confuse those that are lost. You say, well, I'll do it in private. Nobody will see me. God will see you. Let me give you an example. Notice this verse again. All things are lawful. What he simply means is it's not sinful, but you will hinder somebody. Let me give you an example. Imagine that I drove up today. I drove up in my truck today due to the weather. But imagine I drove up today in a 2019 Lamborghini. You'd say, Whew, preacher must be doing really good. 
And I pulled it right up in the front door of the awning. And I just parked it right there so everybody could see it. People drive by, they think we have a superstar here. Now, there'd be nothing wrong with me owning a Lamborghini. If I could afford it, I'd buy one. And I'd drive that thing around. There's nothing wrong with a Lamborghini, but it wouldn't be expedient for the preacher to have a Lamborghini. That'd be odd when to go visit. Go visit some of these areas in a Lamborghini. I think the illustration is true. I think the illustration is right. Paul's saying, yes, as under grace, yes, under, under the, the measure of grace, you can do anything you want to do, but it's not expedient. What he's simply saying is, it's not sinful, but you partake in it, you, you get involved in it, that you're going to hurt somebody that does not know Christ. Notice what he says, verse 25. For whatsoever is sold in the shambles that eat, asking no questions for conscience sake. You know what he just said? If I go to your house and you fix something, I'm to ask you no questions, I'm to eat it. I'll say the blessing over it. You know why? Because I don't want to offend you. That's what God's saying. If I go in and sit down and somebody fixed a very small meal, that, that's all they had, and all they had was beans and, and, and maybe a, a, a sliver of a pie, or, and it was a small, poor type meal, I guess if you could say it, it was small. God says, I'm not to say anything negative about that because I don't want to offend somebody that fixed that. That's exactly what he says about our life. Why am I dying to self? Why am I trying to live lawfully and expedient? Why am I trying to live in such a way that I would not offend or try to coerce or try to destroy someone else's faith? Why? That they might be saved. Notice this. He says, ask you no questions for conscience sake. Verse 26, for the Lord, for the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast and you be disposed to go, Whatsoever is set before you, ask no questions for conscience sake. Now if someone sets skunk in front of me, or possum, I might have to question the Lord on that. But he says, eat it. Why? So you wouldn't offend. Notice verse 29. Conscience I say unto thine own, but not the other. Why is my liberty judge of another man's conscience? Verse 31. Whether there you eat or drink, whatsoever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Giving none offense, neither the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor the church of God. And it all boils down to this. Even as I please all men in all things, not seeking mine own. There's a lot of times as a pastor, there's a lot of times as a preacher, I go to a certain place or go to a certain business and I have to die to self. Why? Because I have to remember I'm a Christian. I have to remember that I'm representing the Lord, but I'm also representing Twin City Baptist Church. If I walk into Walmart and somebody cuts me off, I'd like to trip them <laughs> and push them down. That's what the flesh says. But the Spirit says they may need to be saved. Is it lawful? Maybe. Am I rightly in doing so? Maybe. But it's not expedient. Why? Because that individual may need to be saved. I tell a funny story. Years, years ago, I got behind somebody coming down this road right here by the library. They were going like, five miles an hour, driving me bananas. I was late, need to get to church. This guy, he's driving down the road. I wanted, I wanted to blow my horn and then run him off, do a little, you know, bump, bump there with the racing. They call rubbing racing, you know, I was going to sort of nudge him, <laughs> run him off the road, get him off the road. And I didn't. By the help of God, I stayed behind him and bit my tongue and kept my hands on the steering wheel. Would you believe, as God is my witness, that man pulled into this parking lot. <laughs> and I raised my hand to Jesus and said, Hallelujah. 
I got out. And he said, can I talk to the pastor? I said, right here. <laughs> he said, I want to come to church here. I said, man, we'd love to have you. He had no idea what was on the inside of my heart. But I was thanking God that he caused me to do right. I could have destroyed that individual, not physically, probably, but spiritually. That man came here for some good time. He moved off, but he came here for a long time. That's what I'm trying to get to you today. May God use a small illustration as a fork to cause us to remember that everything about our life hinges on somebody needing to be saved. Everything. It'll change your life. The things that happen to you is for God to use that they might be saved. Let's pray together. Father.